Hello, everybody, and a very good morning, good afternoon, or good evening for wherever you are in the world. I'm Charles Allen. I'm the chair of the Invictus Games Foundation, and it gives me real pleasure to welcome you to this, the eighth iteration of the IGF Conversation. We're so pleased to be hosting this event again, and it's a real pleasure for me to see how the, the conversation has evolved since the first webinar way back in May 2020. What we want to do is discuss relevant issues to, to the Invictus community, including the WES community itself, the wounded, injured and sick individuals, and very importantly, their families in an informal and conversational manner. We very much listen to you on the subjects that are important to you and the subjects you'd like to talk about and learn more about. Last time we came together, which was the amazing Invictus Games in The Hague in April of this year, I know those games reinforce the importance of Invictus and the combined enthusiasm and commitment of the family. They've set us well on the path to Dusseldorf next year. And I know in talking to a number of you, the excitement and momentum is really building. The IGF conversation in The Hague addressed themes of the importance of sport and being able to challenge attitudes towards disability and as well as the key, key role that families play in rehabilitation. As a result, we're continuing to build a pivotal relationship with the International Paralympic Committee, and that will help further develop the impact of the Invictus internationally. We're also reminded of the key role of families in everything that we do, it's such a key role, and it's increasingly gonna be an important theme for us as we move forward to Dusseldorf. Today, we're going to be looking at the long-term effects of amputation and why this is important to so many of the Invictus family and the lessons that have been learned and hopefully some pointers for the future. We're incredibly grateful to our sponsors, the Armed Forces Covenant Fund Trust, Ascot Rehab, Better Up, Boeing, Fisher House Foundation and ISPS Handa. Without their support, this event simply couldn't happen. I hope you find the event interesting, enjoyable, informative. And I'd now like to hand you over to our CEO, Dominic Reed, IGF's CEO. Dominic. Charles, thank you very much. Uh, and I'd like to reiterate Charles's welcome to all of you, wherever you are dialing into this. Um, as he said, it's the eighth iteration and the quality of the series has, has I think, built over time. So very, very high quality information and, and great discussion. And we're going to see more of that today. My topic, my, um, my task this today is very, very simple, is to introduce Dave Henson, who is leading this. Dave, I've known for, for some time, as I have Josh Bodgie, two amputees who really know about the long-term effects of amputation. And I've seen Dave uh, move from being a team captain in, back in 2014 <clears throat> through to becoming a Paralympic medalist in T2 in Rio, which is a, a fantastic thing to see. Josh, who, who was one of the, the, our first uh, triple amputees and who has had a subsequent major setback when he had a, a training accident on his, on his bike, which set him pretty much back uh, to where he started from. So I've been inspired by the, by the, by the quality uh, of their commitment and by the fact that, to, to, to paraphrase what Dave Henson once said, they're loving life. Uh, and it's fantastic to see that. I'm going to um, hand you over to Dave. We've got some fantastic panellists, and I hope you thoroughly enjoy uh, the discussion. Thank you, Dominic, for your kind introduction and welcome everyone to this iteration of the conversation. As has been mentioned, this particular iteration is focused on the long term effects of amputation. And we have some wonderful subject matter experts with us joining on three panel sessions today from academia, medical industry, uh, the NHS, as, as well as from our own Invictus Games community. Now, as Dominic alluded to, amputation is something that is uh, very close to my heart and affects my day-to-day -day basis. And acquiring an amputation is an event that affects every facet of the individual's life, from career choices through to family ambitions and even recreational activities. Now, being faced on a daily basis by tasks and activities that were once simple and pleasurable and are now rendered difficult or frustrating or often impossible to accomplish serves as an unwelcome and regular reminder of what was lost both from a physical and a psychological perspective. Now from my own personal perspective I understand that on an emotional level the small things matter most 
you know, Dominic mentioned that I was a Paralympic athlete. That's a real positive and a plus point in my life. Um, but really what I want to be able to do is to carry my children up and down stairs or go on walks with my friends, ride a bike or mow the lawn or any number of daily tasks that are facile or trivial for most individuals, but are quite complex when you're missing a few pins. Um, I guess the point in this is that it's the human factor that matters most. And you from today, from the three panel sessions that we've got, will really understand how that human factor is at the heart of everything. And it underpins everything that we'll discuss today, uh, from medical treatment, research, technical procedures, um, and about the delivery and uh, analysis of rehabilitation. Uh, underneath all of this is the key role of the individual and the families that are backing them in the background. As I mentioned, in terms of format of the event, this is split into three panel sessions, each panel session discussing a key theme. Um, and we'll draw from the speakers from each panel uh, their expertise and present that to you today. Now, in terms of administration, if you have any questions for any of our panel, panel members, please use the, the, chat fun, the chat function on your platform uh, and those will come through to us here. Uh, now, moving to panel one, uh, accompanying me or joining me in panel one are two excellent speakers. We have group captain Alex Bennett. Uh, Alex has been a consultant in rheumatology and rehabilitation at the Defence Medical Rehab Rehabilitation Centre since 2008. And he was appointed the Defence Professor of Rheumatology and Rehabilitation in 2017. Josh Bodji was injured on his third tour of Afghanistan when he was the second in command of a Royal Engineers search team, but has not let his injuries define him. He is a former Invictus Games competitor and now a whiz liaison manager at the Invictus Games Foundation. Welcome, Alex and Josh. It's great to have you here with us uh, today. I'm going to start with you, Alex. Um, you are the head of the advanced study and you're going to talk to us for a few minutes about the advanced study, please. Certainly, Dave. Um, firstly, thank you very much for the, for the kind introduction and the um, invitation. Delighted to be here. Um, I've just got a couple of slides to give you a background on the advance, then we can discuss results and, and other things as, as you see fit, Dave. So basically, the advanced study, if you're not aware, is, is a study looking at the long term consequences of combat trauma. And that is related to Afghanistan specifically in this study. Um, and it's a it's a collaboration between MOD, um, Imperial and Kings. I'm the head of the project board. But um, absolutely couldn't do any of this by myself. And Christopher Booz, who retired a cardiologist from the military, but still a, 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 an academic and cardiologist of the NHS. Professor Anthony Bull from Imperial, Professor Paul Cullinan from Imperial and Professor Nicola Fear from um, King's are absolute key members. Um, our main question for the study is what are the long term medical and psychosocial outcomes of combat trauma? This is not specific to amputation, but as you'll see in my next couple of slides, amputees are a significant part of the study. We want to look at medical and psychosocial outcomes from a medical perspective. We're looking at cardiovascular risk and disease. We're looking at metabolic disease in terms of diabetes and obesity. We're looking at bone health in terms of osteoarthritis and osteoporosis, pain and chronic pain, respiratory function, hearing and mortality. Equally as important is the psychosocial outcomes. As you were mentioning yourself, Dave, you know, your day-to-day -day function. Um, uh, occupational outcomes, really important, quality of life, mental health, relationships, and then and use and abuse of alcohol or drugs. Um, this, oh, this is a, um, so the, the, this is the cohort so far. We've, we have um, been, the study's been running for a little while. It took us four years to recruit the cohort. We've got 1,145 participants, and I'm extremely grateful for everyone who takes part. Um, you'll see on the left, there is a, there's 566 non-injured. So this is the comparison group. They're matched for age, um, sex, rank and role and deployment, um, but they weren't injured. And then on the injured side, um, you'll see that there are 418 who are injured but not amputees. Uh, there's, a, there's a little photo missing, but then there's also 161 amputees. Um, to put that in perspective, there was about 250, 260 amputees in Afghanistan altogether. Um, the, um, as I say, the visits of, uh, previously um, took part at Headley Court and now take part at Stamford Hall. The baseline is complete, so everyone of the 1,145 have been once. Um, and then we're following people up over a 20-year period uh, at multiple time points. And the first follow-up of about three years from baseline is, is two, three quarters complete at the moment. 
You come for a full day of testing, a lot of questionnaires, blood tests, cardiac and lung function tests, and then imaging with x-rays of hips and knees, bone um, DEXA scan looking at bone density and body composition, and also more recently, MRI scan of the brain. And just very quickly to say, um, we couldn't do any of this without the, um, the advanced um, charity, um, expertly chaired by Lord Boyce, who we're very grateful to him and the trustees, and of course our funders, Heady Court Charity being the major funder. So thank you to all of these on the screen. So that is a rough overview um, of the study so far, um, Dave. Thank you ever so much for that, Alex. It's, it's much appreciated. Now, both Josh and I are participants in this advanced study and have been um, since the start of it. Now, could you, do you think, provide us any uh, specific findings, um, perhaps that have had a wider impact on medicine and research, but specific findings from the study so far? I know it's early days. Yeah. So, um, yeah, although, although we've, I've been working on it for about 10 years now, um, we, we are um, have just in the last uh, yeah, 12 months been publishing our baseline findings. So if I break those down into the, the different areas of, of that I was talking about, so cardiovascular risk or cardiovascular health to start with. Um, and this is uh, if I look at generally um, injured versus non-injured and I'll focus on amputees as we go through the, through here. Um, we have found that if you've been injured, then you have a higher cardiovascular risk than if you haven't been injured. To put this in context, this is on average eight years since injury. Um, and also to put this in context, the average age at injury is 26 and the average age at this follow up point is 34. So it's quite a young age group. Um, the cardiovascular risk that we're identifying is is at the moment more academic and research rather than clinically significant. So as a group, it's not saying everyone who's been injured needs to go on antihypertensives and anti-cholesterol treatment. What it's saying is there's a difference and we need to watch that and see if it becomes more clinically significant with time. So that's, and, and, and the other thing that we found with cardiovascular risk is that it seems to increase with the severity of the trauma. Now, you will probably ask me, what about amputees? At the moment, we don't know specifically for amputees. The amputees clearly tend to be the more severely injured. Um, we know that severe, more severe injury leads to higher cardiovascular risk. But at the moment, we haven't yet unpicked whether amputation in isolation from severity of injury is a specific risk factor. In terms of mental health, we've got some interesting findings there. Again, maybe unsurprisingly, you would um, you won't you you would you wouldn't be surprised to hear that the overall group of those who are injured have um, slightly worse mental health outcomes in terms of depression, anxiety, and PTSD. But very interestingly, if you're an amputee, you seem to be protected from that. So if you're an amputee, you're no different from if someone who was um, the the comparison group who wasn't injured, which I think is very interesting. And on the flip side, those who have a a positive what's called post-traumatic growth so a positive experience from trauma um, that is much more marked in those who are amputees than other injured people who weren't amputees so there's something about being an amputee that protects you from the negative mental health um, effects and gives you a more positive outcome from trauma but to caveat that this is at one time point at the moment eight years from from injury yeah. Um, well, if, if I bring Josh into that at the minute, Josh, you and I have been in this situation uh, as amputees for about 12 years now. So if we stick on the psychological factor just now, how do you think that relates to you? Um, I feel like we were, I say lucky, Dave, I think you'd agree with me. We were lucky we went to Headley Court, which is a good baseline to start because we were surrounded by everyone who was in the same situation as us. So we, myself and you said, Yourself and I were at Headley Court at the same time, pushing each other to become better and learn on our legs, etc. Um, so psychologically, I feel like we're lucky that we've we've got that shared experience of Headley Court, but also it's that it's I, I feel like we 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 had to get better. We couldn't sit there and worry uh, and not try and improve the situation we found ourselves in. We had to physically. And mentally say, right, this has happened to us. We've lost a limb, we've lost an arm, leg, whatever you've lost. If you sit there and feel sorry for yourself, you're never going to move on in life. So for me, psychologically, it was that acceptance that legs and arms or whatever you've lost had gone. I don't know how you felt. Yeah, definitely. For me, 
um, and Alex, you'll be very familiar with this. Uh, there was a, a huge amount of value, particularly when considering the growth aspects of the peer-based rehabilitation systems, which we were uh, subjected to, perhaps as a crude term, uh, during our period of, of rehabilitation. That that peer group and having uh, those people uh, you know, a, a, an extra family around you was crucial and, and certainly in relation to your findings in the sort of CV domain uh, of, of the advanced study, you know, we were uh, thrashed from a physical exercise point of view from morning to night, it certainly felt like, and, and hopefully that put us in uh, a relatively um, positive position when it comes to cardiovascular health. But I could understand that as time goes on and we move away from those um, more regimented structures to a rehabilitation process, underpinning that with uh, the understanding that rehabilitation is probably needs to take place over a lifetime. Um, how do you see those cardiovascular findings changing as we move forward? Do, are you concerned by them? It's, it's, a, it's a great point from, from both of you. So clearly, Activity um, plays a major role in terms of some of your cardiovascular um, um, risks and in terms of your weight, in terms of your, your cardiovascular fitness. Um, the, the data that we've looked at so far is independent of exercise. So we're at the moment, we've recorded exercise fairly crudely on a questionnaire basis. Moving forward in terms of advance and, and for our um, second follow up moving forward, we're going to be using wearables to actually uh, monitor um, uh, our, our participants and exactly get exact data on how much activity is going on. But at the moment, it's it's not just put down to the lifestyle factors of activity and and perhaps um, weight and body mass. Um, there seems to be something else. There might be a systemic effect of of trauma or potentially blast injury, which has a long term effect which alters maybe the inflammation in your body, but also um, lipid profile, so your cholesterol, your triglycerides. How it all pans out is going to be very interesting. And, and I have to re-emphasize at the moment the data that I'm, the results I'm telling you are at one time point eight years from injury. And we may find that actually, although there's a significant difference at the moment in the injured versus the non-injured, that, that doesn't get any bigger as time goes on. And, and it doesn't become clinically significant. We may find that the difference gets greater and greater. And that's why it's so important to have a study like this and to follow up at all the follow-up points for quite a long period of time. Um, I wanted to touch quickly on, on pain. So Josh and I are, are very familiar and, and at risk of, of, of talking for Josh, um, being subjected to high levels of pain uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm talking away from the initial insult of injury, um, has a huge effect on both our physical and mental well-being. Um, do you have plans to address that? And are there any other uh, elements of amputee life that you'll be addressing in future? Yeah, so so um, again, pain. So one of the things that, um, again, I'd like to say is that we we very much value our participants and we we have regular, um, part, and, and their views, not just them taking part, but their views. We have regular participant panels. We have a, a very active group of 30 or 40 people who attend those. And actually pain has been one of the things that's come up over and over again. Pain is we do a lot of pain questionnaires, but we're also looking into um, the more even more complex areas of pain. Um, and and um, we're, we're doing that in collaboration with with other um, academics at Imperial. So Professor Andrew Rice, we really want to drill down into the, the, the detail of pain. Um, if we can predict who gets worse pain um, and clearly in the longer term, we would like to in, um, improve the management of pain. Um, there, there's clearly there's very good pain services out there, but pain is clearly still present in a lot of our participants. And as I said, it comes up over and over again as a, as a top priority. So, yes, we are looking at it. We haven't got any data on it at the moment because that is on the to-do list, but it is it is being done. Our, our to-do list is quite long, um, and uh, um, and and it, we're taking it very very seriously and, and combining with some world experts in pain. And I guess Josh, to, to bring you in on this particular point, um, there is definitely a worry within our community specifically about pain because um, the kind of pain that you experience as, as an amputee on a day-to-day -day basis doesn't seem to be. Um, manageable in any meaningful way by medication and certainly medication over the long term is generally recommended to be avoided. Now, uh, I wondered if you 
would touch on your experiences of pain and, and whether you have any concerns from the wider community of, of, of amputees, in, Invictus or other, uh, about management of pain, personal medication, that kind of thing? So for me, uh, being an amputee, and especially being a mobile amputee like yourself, Dave, is uh, pain can be solved in many ways. It can be uh, it can be from the fact medication, but I found a lot of my pain personally came from socket fit. Um, when I'm actually up and about and walking, um, and having the right socket that fits and doesn't rub, and it, it, it alleviates a lot of the pain. But then again, if you're up and about and you're walking, the next step along is the fact that you're getting lower back pain from walking on your legs, or your, or if you do fall over or anything like this. It's not just a simple question of just curing pain; it's longevity as well. It, a lot of this is down to you as an individual looking after yourself. If you look after yourself, I found. Um, don't get me wrong, we've we all got to Headley Court and we went on the Headley Court diet of Domino's Pizza, etc. Um, but the minute you rip, I, I ended up putting a lot of weight on and struggling to walk on prosthetics. So rip, when I started losing weight, I was able to walk better and better. I was able to walk, walk more functionally and the pain sort of sort of fell off as well, um, which meant I could come off all the pain meds that you were prescribed at Headley Court. Um, Post second injury, as Dominic alluded to earlier, had a bike crash in Mallorca in 2019. In my head, I had to get off the pain meds straight away because I I saw them as holding me back. Um, but again, moving on from that, when I did start get up and when I did got when I did start getting up and about and walking again, my lower back started hurting. So, but to alleviate that, it's stretching, doing all those functional things that will alleviate the pain. Um, I, again, I'm sure you find the same, Dave. Yeah, absolutely. It's the day to day management management of it that's so important. And again, I think having that community around you, even just things like monitoring whether you're doing any per, you know, indulging in any kind of personal medication, that kind of stuff to make sure um, that your long term health is uh, is, I guess, as robust as possible. Um, uh, Alex, I'll ask you one one more quick question, whether you you know, you've been planning the advanced study for a long time. Have you been surprised yet? Yeah, um, very good question. Um, I think that, as I alluded to, this is these are our first results that we've been looking at over the last 12 months. Um, in a young cohort, at our first look, if you see what I mean, eight, eight years from injury. And I think the thing, I, I think we've maybe been surprised, not in one specific area, but that at this stage, relatively in a young cohort, relatively early from an injury, we are finding signals everywhere we look. Yeah. So, so, you know, what does that say? It says that the, the trauma that this cohort went through is clearly very significant. And I don't think anyone is doubting that. But it's having biological and psychological effects at eight years who knows it may have been at four years if we had managed to do it at that you know at that point and and the the likelihood is although i can't predict it is that some of those will get more significant as time goes on but some of them may drop away so i think the 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 only surprise is and it's a slight surprise it's not a massive surprise but there are everywhere we look we're finding differences yeah yeah um well i guess you know, we're coming towards uh, the close of this particular panel session. So uh, from both Josh and my perspective, Alex, the advanced study is an excellent example of how uh, long term research studies should be structured and should be conducted. So from the moment you arrive as a study participant until the moment you leave, you're treated with utmost respect. And uh, as a as a long term participation member, you are always kept up to date with the findings uh, and any modifications or changes to the study as it goes through. So I really do think it's an excellent example of how to do uh, long term research. We certainly are very much looking forward to how the results develop. We're keeping a keen eye on the findings findings you know, from all spheres, whether that's physical or mental health, to make sure um, as a peer group we can bring um, this knowledge to bear in the best way possible. And certainly conversations like these are crucial to achieving those kind of things. So thank you both very much for your participation in this particular panel, and we will move on to panel two. So in panel two, we have uh, Dr. Rodri Phillip, uh, ex-Army Rehabilitation Medicine and Rheumatology Consultant. Um, Roger remains clinical 
and continues to work in trauma and musculoskeletal skeletal rehabilitation in the London and Surrey area. We also have Professor Anthony Bull. Anthony is a professor of musculoskeletal mechanics at Imperial College London, and as you will have just heard from Alex, sits on the project board of the advanced study. Matthew Hughes. Matt joined Dorset Orthopaedic in 2011 uh, and has been the managing director since 2019. He is both a clinician uh, treating prosthetic and orthotic clients, uh, including myself. We have Major Dr. Peter Lefer. Peter is a professional development lead with critical care and trauma physiotherapy for UK Defence Medical Services and uses his defence role and position in the Armed Forces Clinical Reference Group at NHS England to challenge an alternative approach to healthcare and its research. Welcome, everybody. There was certainly a mouthful of titles there, but it's good to have you all with me today. Uh, I'm going to start off, Rodri, with you. Um, Please, do you think you could talk to us about the work you did at the DMRC uh, for this particular group of patients, i.e. those with amputations, and where your work currently stands at being able to translate these findings into the wider healthcare system? Um, well, firstly, thank you very much for inviting me to join this uh, panel. Um, from, a, from a Headley Court or Stamford Hall, I suppose, to the latter stages perspective, um, there were three real components to hopefully what we were able to provide in terms of a rehabilitation service. The first was making sure everything was patient focused. Um, very early on, we learned that just because patients had very similar injuries, it didn't mean that they should be treated exactly the same or go through the same rehab journey. And often the journeys were very, very different, partly as a result of other injuries that they may have sustained, people's personal factors, motivations, mental health at the time and, and all of those other elements. So every patient journey was an individual one and each individual needed to be supported in a slightly different way. Um, the second aspect was making sure we had a really good team around them. So patient in the center with a team around, um, but comprised multi, diff, multiple therapy and, and different medical skills, be it from occupational therapy to physio, uh, through from surgeons to medics, et cetera. Uh, and as time got on, we got that, that team grew and we got uh, more and more specialties involved, uh, particularly when we had quite a bit of genital injuries and brought in endocrinologists and things like that as well. So that as that team grew, the expertise grew as well for the, both the team and also the individuals involved in those patients. Um, and one of the key elements then became good communication throughout the team um, and making sure we had a consistent service. So even though at one point we had four different rehab consultants looking after the groups, um, everybody hopefully patient-wise was getting the same level of service, uh, whoever was involved in their care. And the final thing really, and it's one thing that I've noticed a lot more since I've uh, left the military, is the ability to have timely intervention. So I'm involved in quite a lot of sort of insurance cases at the moment where often patients are having some treatment privately and having some treatment through the NHS. And the importance of getting interventions at, uh, at the right time so they get are able to continue their journey smoothly is really key. And we often see it with big gaps between reviews from surgical teams or delays in prosthetic delivery and things like that really upset the, upset the process and make it harder for the patients to uh, do uh, as well as their potential would allow them to. Uh, and so that's certainly something that's become more obvious to me, certainly um, as a, after leaving the military where we had a little bit more control over those aspects. It was certainly something which always impressed me when I was at, at Headley Court. Um, you know, the number of patients that were in at any one time was was massive, you know, given the complexity of care requirements of all the individuals that were there. So it was a highly complex environment. But, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. I very much, uh, despite being in a, uh, a very focused peer based rehabilitation system, I have a personalized, itemized care plan, which allowed me to progress in the best way, the most appropriate way that was for me. And I think that's one thing which is absolutely outstanding about the, the multidisciplinary delivery of care that took place at, at Headley Court. It was unique and not to the individual all at the same time and, and, and it, in just the right amounts, I suppose. Um, Anthony, I'll, I'll move on to you uh, quickly. Given the information that we've heard in the previous session from Alex, so the, the advanced study stuff, the, the knowledge, the understanding, that which Roger's just talked about, what do you think we can learn from existing medical research and how are we building on this to shape future rehabilitation practices? Yeah, and that's a really difficult question, Dave, but I'll just, I'll, I'll start by, by saying that 
load or force changes your muscles. It changes your bones and it changes your joints. We all know that if we exercise more, our muscles get stronger. And we can change that load by changing our own body mass, for example, by changing how we move, not just the activity like running or jumping, but subtle changes in our movement can change all of those things. And for an amputee, by changing how the prosthesis transmits load to our bodies through the junction of the prosthesis to the limb remnant, or even by changing the prosthesis itself. And so one of the things that the advanced study has found and is known from some other studies is that bone density is reduced at the top of the thigh bone for amputees. And this reduction is greater for an above knee amputee than a below knee amputee. And so one of the things that we need to think about is how to maintain bone health or maintain that bone density for amputees. And, and what can we do? You know, um, we can change the way the load is transmitted by increasing localized loading at the top of your thigh bone without overloading your muscles and joints. And there are many technological ways and rehabilitation ways that you can imagine that this could be done. And we need to look forward to implementing those and to working out if they are effective. For example, use of electrical stimulation, which is used in many other ways. Uh, some of the people on the line might use electrical stimulation to increase muscle mass, but actually you can use it in a smart way to change the way you walk, the way you move. Rehab physicians are very smart at this as well changing your sockets, using osseointegration to change the way the load is transmitted to your bone, or even having bone caps on the end of your thigh bone. And there are a couple of these implants now in clinical trials around the world. So I think there are different ways we can start implementing um, rehab in the future, but it requires more advanced technology. And I assure you, um, I myself, many people are working on this. There's another area that I think is worth picking up on, which is the energy demands for an amputee getting tired, muscle fatigue. And I, there are clearly different ways that that can be influenced at the early stage by changing the surgical intervention, potentially, that took place at the point of definitive amputation, but also by having powered prostheses, prostheses that actually apply a flexion or extension torque that drive the motion in a way that means that your hip muscles are not having to do so much work. And I think that um, it, it's terrible that we're in a position where there are very few of these implants currently in use and none of them provide the control and the feel for the amputee, which allows them to do the things that they want to do. As you mentioned, carry your daughter up and down the stairs, for example. Um, and finally, maybe in a, in a sort of more space, uh, sort of futuristic thing, we do need to think about regenerative medicine and the point of wounding and maintaining as much tissue as possible. Um, you know, and there are examples of this, you know, people have limb lengthening procedures, you know, do we use them sufficiently for amputees where we can provide more material, more tissue, better lever arms that then help function, help bone health, help joint health. Thanks, Anthony. And I, I guess we should stick with technology. And Matt, I'll come to you. I know that Dorset Orthopaedic are, are probably uh, the number one civilian provider of osseointegration type services, uh, definitely in the UK. Um, and this is one of the technological medical research processes which has been um, generating an awful lot of interest, perhaps quietly in the early days, but becoming a little bit louder over the last few years. Do you, do you think you could talk uh, to that and perhaps some of the other technologies that Anthony's spoken about? Thanks, Dave. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think, and, and, and I'll be careful um, to talk within my field as a leg fitter as, as opposed to, to a medic. So my background is prosthetics and I guess um, the really interesting bit there and it's interesting listening to everybody that's spoken so far is that that, that amputation rehabilitation has uh, in the 20 years that I've been doing it has kind of come on leaps and bounds for want of a better description you know the technology is advancing the, the, the really vital bit the really really critical bit still in terms of um, patients being able to be functional and mobile and, 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 and lead the lives that they want to do is that interface between the prosthesis and the body. And I think in the first panel, Josh talked about um, pain and he talked about the socket being right. And, and you know, we've, we've, we've battled with that for years. You know, Dave, you, you, you do that on a, on a daily basis. And once you've got something that, that is right, you, you don't want to touch it and you don't want to change it and you just want to kind of go with it. Um, Osseo integration is not something that's new. It's been around for a long time. Um, the technology has been there for years and years and years. But it, 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 I guess that the momentum of um, how that's been brought into 
um, the world of, of, of amputees and trying to restore um, mobility for amputees is, is definitely built up traction and momentum in the last, I'd say, 10 or 15 years. Uh, we've been working with um, osteo patients in the UK for about seven years now. We've got 50 patients that we look after, which is a really small number of patients. But 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 in terms of civilian numbers, it, it, it's quite high. Um, and I don't believe as a, as a prosthetist that every amputee should have osseointegration. integration. I think, it, and, it, and again, it comes down to it, it's, it's horses for courses. It's finding the, the most appropriate delivery of um, rehabilitation and prosthesis to, to, for, for each individual patient. But there are times where we've tried everything that we possibly can. We've had, um, you know, secondary um, uh, people looking at, um, at patients, looking at revisional stump surgeries, trying to improve um, the, the, the actual residual limb itself to allow us to, to make a comfortable socket. But, but, but it, sometimes that beats us. Sometimes it becomes you know, bigger than that. And, and sometimes if, if then medically osseointegration integration is appropriate, it's a real game changer. You know, what, we're, what we are effectively doing, I guess, is, is in my simple mind, is, is, is implanting a, a, a metal um, device into, into the bone, which we can then physically attach the, the, the prosthesis, prosthesis to as it comes out of the residual limb. That, in its simplistic fashion, is kind of replicating you know, and replacing the skeleton you know, that's been removed. So from a, um, an alignment perspective, everything in terms of how the body functions, it works much better in some instances than conventional sockets because the movement of the, of, of the, of the thigh bone, if you like, is, is, is instant and it's direct in terms of its connection to the prosthesis. Whereas in a socket, that, 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 that femur sometimes moves before it then hits the socket, before it then moves the prosthesis forward. So that connection from the patient's perspective and that, that kind of positive um, uh, grounding, if you like, and, and, and connectivity to the prosthesis, it, the feedback from the patients is, is, is far greater. And, and it takes away that, that feeling of, you know, being locked in a socket, you know, from a comfort point of view, it makes lots of sense. You know, I, I, I'm very fortunate. I, 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 I cannot and haven't experienced this, you know, personally, but, but the feedback from patients is, is about, you know, I'm sitting on me. I'm not sitting on a hard socket. Um, I can get on a, on a, on a bike. Um, you know, it, it's a quick, instant process of connecting prosthesis to, to, to them. You know, there's not this kind of layered kind of process of, of putting, you know, different liners and socks and things on and then attaching a prosthesis. And so so it, it's, it's much more instant. There are lots of positives, but that is not to say that it is, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the perfect solution, far from it. Rodri, to bring this into a, a wider healthcare perspective, um, we can stick with osseo integration as the example. Uh, as Matt said, this is uh, a technology or a technique that's, that's been around for some time, and yet it does seem to remain fairly restricted as to who it's applicable to. Do you, uh, do you think, uh, probably a two part question here, do you think you could um, touch on why that is and could you see it being distributed as a treatment mechanism more widely? Um, well, almost to answer your the second part first, really, there is currently an NHS panel that's looking at osseointegration, integration, uh, examining the evidence and potentially looking at that to formulate policy going forward. There is the ability on the NHS at the moment to get osseointegration integration under a special commissioning process, which is, to be honest, a rel without wanting to be too cruel, a relatively long winded process of going through it. But there is the opportunity to do that under specialist circumstances. And, and those, there is a, a defined set for those at the moment. Uh, the military was involved in an NHS trial with OSI integration, and we were seen as, as a, a good group of people uh, to go through the process and try it, partly because of the rehab setup that we had available. Uh, and partly because obviously we had patients very similar to yourself with multiple injuries that made conventional sockets very difficult to fit. Um, and so we initially selected patients who were essentially wheelchair bound and therefore not tolerating sockets so that if it did go wrong, patients were in a wheelchair as opposed to being put in a wheelchair having been previously mobile. And the results in those patients have been very positive. Um, uh, even though there's been occasional setbacks, requirements for further surgery, a couple of people have been mobile enough to then fall over and break their hips, which uh, obviously brings a new drama. Um, so there, there, there's, there's sort of pros and cons and then cons to the pros, shall we say, as well. 
Um, but the, you know, one of the patients texts me every Christmas to say thank you for another year on legs that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, and it's just very simple text, but it's one of those things where you realize that actually it can have quite a profound impact on people who otherwise didn't have other opportunities. And I think Matt sums it up quite nicely in that it isn't perfect for everyone, but for those patients who are not tolerating sockets and have very few other options, it can be a complete game changer. And when we're looking at promoting good health and all of those other elements, anything that gets people vertical and moving has got to be a positive over leaving them in a wheelchair. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I don't think I could agree more. And certainly there's elements of it which uh, which definitely address Anthony's points that he made earlier about about loading and perhaps even moving towards the uh, bone mineral density loss, you know, the loss of bone constructs material, as it were, um, which offers so much potential in that space. So it, it's very exciting. And um, for the, the people that I know who have undergone this procedure, it has absolutely, as you say, been life changing because they have been in a position before where they weren't mobile and it has completely transformed their life in such a positive way. Um, really, really exciting thing to, to watch. But I, I guess, Pete, coming to you now, um, with it, with every new advancement like this, Anthony mentioned some extreme examples at the start. We've heard about um, osseo integration. Uh, there are there is risk associated with new medical procedures. Um, Pete, what are your views on how we best balance medical evidence with a practical reality of treating someone or multiple people at the same time? Thanks, Dave, for that question. Um, I think uh, the I think the cohort who went through Headley Court are, are, is a brilliant case study um, of how we um, we introduce innovation into into our medical approaches and and um, so within the the research which which I was doing at Imperial, um, which is bolted onto the advanced study, we see um, it, I was collecting um, I was taking the outcome measures from advance and I was uh, triangulating them, if you like, with some of the accounts from the veterans and from the, the clinicians. And what was really interesting when we, we did that was you, you start to see this, um, this, this experiential account about how um, Headley Court as a case study was flooded with complexity, com complex cases we'd never seen with no clear um, evidence base on how we, we were going to we were going to develop our practice but but what what happened within the organization was there was a, a coming together a, a collaborative approach of of different professions from different backgrounds um, and that was enabled by the chain of command and it was that process that social process that uh, enabled us to challenge what we were doing to experiment um, and to perform a safe to fail experiments, if you like, and to learn from what worked and what didn't work. And I think, and it was that, um, so we, we would call that collaborative approach an interdisciplinary team approach. And that was fundamental, it, certainly for the outcomes um, that, that came out of my own study. Um, when I asked both clinicians and patients, what were the some of the key components, um, key features of rehab we should take away? They didn't specify clinical features. They specified the fact this interdisciplinary approach. Um, and so I so I think this is one of the the key ways in which we can we can, or a key organisational or cultural feature that that if we can in, input that into healthcare settings where we can bring both the research basis and the medical need, and then we can just we can work this out together um, as we share practice, share ideas. I, I guess in. Um... In relation to what we said in the introduction, you know, the importance of the human factor underpinning all of this, um, we've spoken about the multidisciplinary approach to rehab. Um, I guess it's a bit of an open question for, for Pete, for both you and, and perhaps for Rodri to come into. How important were the patients in this military group, the attitudes, those kind of things, to how successful the program was? So can I um, uh, just correct one bit of uh, terminology? So, um, so the multidisciplinary approach is, is one way you've got your separate teams working in parallel. And whereas the interdisciplinary approaches, we've dispensed with these separate, these separate professional entities and we're all pursuing the same goal. And I think um, that's what we need in a complex setting. And the, the other thing that's important to note about that is what, what happened at Headley Court was, was the, 
there was a shift in culture from skill set to to a cult, to to a mindset and what i mean by that is that the the multidisciplinary departments of physio ot and the rest of it they were dissolved and we and teams were formed around the patient need around complex trauma around lower limbs and when you do that you then redefine uh, what the clinicians are looking at they're no longer looking to preserve their professional identity they're looking to for the the, the patient need which now defines their group and and that's and so in that context you then start to to um, generate uh, a exploratory approach if you like to how can we do this better because now the patient is at the center of the clinician's effort. Um, I don't know if, Rod, if you want to add anything to that. Well, the only thing I was going to say, Dave, is, is that actually having patients like yourselves and, and many others uh, challenging us all along the way was mm. actually key because, to be blunt, as a group of clinicians, we were learning quite a lot. Um, there were a lot of us, as we call it, unexpected survivors amongst the military cohort, which meant there were a lot of um, essentially new problems to deal with. And having a, a try try things out and see how it works out with willing patients who accept that. And I think part of the thing we were hopefully trying to instill some confidence amongst you guys that we knew what we we're doing, but being honest where we didn't know what the outcome would be um, and therefore doing it as a group together. And, and I, I, I hope there was an element whereby as, as we were, we were learning off you guys as well as you learning from the therapy staff as we went through things. And actually what did tend to happen was once we got to see the same problems two or three times and patients were feeding back what was working, what wasn't working, you got to be better at what you were doing. So as the numbers increased, actually our skill level increased as well. And that hopefully meant that we were able to, uh, even though we were getting higher numbers and higher workloads, actually able to deliver the same consistency of service because of the input from patients previously. Um, and you know, some of the most vocal challenges of some of the things we did actually were really good because it makes you sit back and think actually are we accepting this as this is how we should do it or do we actually need to change tack here or is that not appropriate in this situation and so i think that two-way conversation with patients is, is really key because uh, if you don't understand what the problems people are going through you're, you're never going to work out a good rehabilitation program to help them absolutely and uh, to go on pete I was just yeah, I was just going to come in there. This is is such a it's such such an important point really that the the patient is centre, and and because the patient centre of this team, they you could in a research term we call it a community of practice. But there's again there's there's fabulous accounts of the way in which this community of practice developed, where there was a a free sharing not just between professions but between clinician and patient, and this really was critical in how you enable a patient to own their rehab process as well as to to also support the clinician who's often working in a space that's that's unknown to them and and, and so it's very much it's got to be this partnership together thanks for that pete um just i'll quickly turn to anthony for one last question um the advanced study has has really paved the way i think as we heard in the last session um for delivering long-term studies and in this panel session we've heard about uh i guess the state of the art where we are now can we learn from how do we best learn from where we are now and take the lessons of the advanced study to deliver on those kind of technological approaches which you talked about earlier that's a massive massive question and i think the first thing to say is that the advanced study is scientifically complex because all of you participants in the advanced study um, would justifiably want the results from the study to influence your own care, your own treatment. And as such, we're not just observing what is happening, but we are also potentially going to be treating. And that changes the study significantly, and that will change for the participants, but also for other people who have had similar injuries um, elsewhere. As such, the numbers in the study have to be significant, have to be uh, to the level that they are. And I think there are very few such studies that could be implemented elsewhere. We know of no study where physical health is being measured physically with people coming into, um, into, into a testing center, such as Stanford Hall, Headley Court. Um, and that's hard to replicate. There are many other cohorts 
where the results from advance will actually bleed into and feed into. For example, you can imagine the Manchester Arena bombing cohort, uh, where there are amputees, um, many young individuals who will benefit from advance as well. And so I think we just need to make sure that the communication continues, that we publish and publicize the outcomes, the results of this work, and that we then act on them as quickly as we can. I would certainly hope that conversation sessions like this really add to that and, and add to that body of knowledge and progression um, of these technologies, research decisions, clinical care um, pathways forward. Um, we're going to end there this panel two session. Um, Pete, Matt, Anthony, Rodri, thank you ever so much uh, for your time this afternoon, being so candid with your answers. We really, really appreciate it. Um, thank you very much. So moving on to panel three. Uh, we have uh, Miss Alexandra Crick, who is a consultant plastic surgeon. Uh, and reconstructive surgeon at Salisbury since 2008. Uh, she is the clinical lead within the Veterans Trauma Network and clinical lead for Armed Forces Service within the hospital. We have Sarah Cecil, a chartered sports psychologist who has worked in the Olympic and Paralympic sport for over 20 years. She was a sports psychologist for British Athletics team in London 2012. Heinrich Popov was amputated above the knee due to bone cancer at the age of nine. He won gold in the 100 metres at the London 2012 Paralympics and is now an Otto Bock ambassador and brilliant dancer. Didier Simmons was a petty officer EOD diver in the Belgian Navy and suffered from a mine accident in 1989. Four months into his rehab, Didier became handy sport champion in Belgium and competed in several Paralympic Games. Uh, first class Sergeant Francisco uh, Osorio. Francisco served in the Colombian National Army as squad and platoon commander of infantry units in peacekeeping missions for almost 25 years. Um, please join us for panel three in just a moment. Hello everyone and welcome to panel three of this eighth iteration of the Invictus Games Foundation conversation. This particular panel uh, concentrates on the human factor. We've mentioned it in the introduction and every panel session since is probably uh, one of the most important elements to any kind of injury and amputation is no different. Um, I know that we have some uh, very vociferous individuals on this call, so I'm hoping that I get to give my voice a little bit of a rest as we go through. But I am going to start with Alex. Alex, you have sliced open many a leg, many an arm, I expect. Um, so I would just ask you to, to touch on any common patterns or themes that you see in your patients during rehabilitation or on your surgical bed. Um, thanks, David. And it's lovely to see both you and Josh uh, on the call already. Um, so I still run a clinic called, which I call the War Injury Clinic, and that was something that I started um, with my colleague Rod Dunn back in 2008. Um, so fairly soon after um, we were being busy with injuries from Afghanistan. Um, and I still run that clinic, and a lot of people are asking me, why, why are you still running that clinic? Because um, it's so many years after the event. Um, and the answer to that is that I'm still seeing guys and girls that were I met when they were still um, serving while they're going through their rehabilitation at uh, Headley Court. Um, and I continue to see those as um, veterans now. And the reason for that is that they are that the parts of you that are injured are aging differently to the rest of you. And in fact, the parts of you that weren't injured will age differently, as we've heard um, from from Alex uh, and and Anthony already, and um, you will develop. You, there's always the potential for you to develop or present with uh, complications of your original injuries, even 10, 20, 30 years down the line, including problems with sepsis associated with implants um, or related to um, the way that fractures may have been treated previously. Um, and then, and finally, if you present with any other medical problems, um, how that is looked after will be complicated by your previous injuries. And Josh is a very, very good example of that. Um, and I'm still seeing um, veterans who are new to me who were injured in Afghanistan, um, who are still needing the sort of um, access to 
expertise or, or people who are familiar with those those style of injuries, the ballistic and the and the blast injuries. Um, so it's it's you probably need um, somebody with that insight into your injuries for the rest of your life. Um, so it's it's a and I'm just there in the background. What you need to do is um, look after yourself for the rest of your life as well. But you need somebody um, or people like me maybe in the background um, with that understanding as well. Understood. Those, I guess, are, are, are critical qualities for a, for a patient to have. Um, you know, if they're going to have a successful rehabilitation, um, you know, there's a, a, an extreme onus on the patient to, to key into that as well. And we certainly heard that loud and clear from both Rogers and Pete and Matt in, in the last panel. Um, I guess we'll, we'll push into sport a little bit and Sarah, we'll come to you with this question. Um, we've just heard from Alex about common patterns. We've heard about qualities that are required. Um, when we move into the sporting world, could you tell us a bit about the competitors and the athletes that you've dealt with, for example, in Team G, um, in TG, Team GB, sorry, which have proven how important sport can be in rehabilitation? Uh, yeah, so again, like Alex, it's great to see uh, Dave and Josh. Um, and and the, the beauty of the athletes I get to see is that I get to expose them to failure and pressure. Um, and that's the beauty of sport is, is we're going to expose you to that and then we're going to teach you how to deal with it. And it's a different type of potential failure or pressure you've had before. Um, but, but by helping you deal with that and exposing you to that, we can really then help. That's so transferable to other elements of life. Um, but, but sporting failure is, is very different than other failure. Um, and that's why it's so important that people like you, Dave, we came and put you in these horribly pressurized situations where you could fail um, and you would feel there were consequences if you did fail. And then people like me can help you on that journey. And that's the power of sport and like high performance sport or any sport where you're going to be on some sort of stage in, in the rehabilitation process. I think it's, it's a good moment to speak to the gold medalist, Tyra Popper. <laughs> um, how you know, I, I don't want to say you probably understand failure, but I think you probably do uh, over the years. How do Sarah's words resonate with you? I remember I lost against you on the 200. <laughs> so we're not going to talk about that. Um, so for me, it was really important to use sport to overcome failure. And um, the beauty of sports is that sports makes no difference. And I realized that through sports, I cre can create self-love. So through sports, and I also through sports understood my new movements. And, uh, you know, the sports often gives you also a different view on your disability. This is something I realized when I was really young. Um, I remember my first um, really happy moment in sports when I was a goalkeeper and then I won a one-to-one a -one situation because my competitor was afraid of my leg so this can be also happen through sports so disability can give you in those moments also an advantage and um, it made me happy and um, I think sports we should we should create a different understanding for sports and I realized that after I uh, finished my career being a Paralympic athlete so every time we see someone with an amputation and we talk about sports, we directly think about Paralympics. But I don't see this. Um, for us, it's um, moving from the morning till the evening and uh, playing around with kids. So daily life is our own sport event. And, and thinking about daily life and thinking about the energy needs amputees have, I think there is no other solution than, uh, than moving sports for a rehabilitation. There might be another one, uh, but this is diff th this happens to me, th and this is different. Um, the other one is uh, having children's view on your on your amputation because children are op always open minded, and uh, so they're not afraid of failure. So, two options to overcome a disability is one is sport, and if you if you if you can't use sport, so, so, so then you maybe. Have a children's view on that so i always recommend to people when they struggle to to overcome the disabilities i always recommend to try to look on their disability with children's views i think i think that part of it is key i, I guess um you know certainly from my, my own experience with my own kids it is so refreshing they do not care about 
<laughs> they'll just ask the question and will be brutal with those questions as well, but always in a very open and honest way. It's, it, it's really good. But to touch on the sports side of it again, um, I'm, uh, I'm Rick and, and Sarah, I think perhaps you could do a double team on, on this particular question. So um, as I went through my rehabilitation and I used sport both at um, an Invictus Games level and a Paralympic level, it created for me um, a new identity as a person. And I guess there's perhaps a concern that um, that sport can can become a crutch, um, but sport and and participation at elite level sport almost inherently has a time limit to it. Heinrich, something which you will have experienced as you retired from the sport. Same with me; I've reti retired from the sport. Um, there are challenges to come out the other side of it. Um, Heinrich, how how have you dealt with moving away from sport? And Sarah, perhaps you could come in after in, in a wider sense. So to be honest, like I was really happy to retire because um, I, I did not retire because I my disability told me to retire. And I, I've always tried to push barriers and I always try to find my own limits. So and my retirement was not based on my own limits. It was based on my age. And this is the beauty also about sport. I had to retire because I was too old and a young Young athletes were kicking me out of the competitive competitive sports, and this is what I love. Um, sport makes no difference, and um, I got kicked out of the elite performance sport because I started to get slowly. And uh, this is something I really love about sports. Sport takes the concentration away and the focus away from your weakness. It gives you back the strength, and it gives you back the competitive way of fighting and the beauty of, of sports and and i realized myself when i used to be in a team sport um so i struggled a lot in team sport because i was relied on on my uh team members so therefore i used track and field and track and field was for me some some really life-changing situations because in track and field um I used my hardest, the hardest way. So having only one leg, I, I, I started to run. So I think if I would miss one arm, I would, I would have tried and shot put. So I've never tried the easy way. And, and in track and field, I find out that there is, this is my track. I can push my own limits. And this is like, I'm, I'm not missing, I'm not missing uh, the elite sports, but I'm sometimes I miss uh, like the challenges. But now being a father, um, I'm not worried about that. I have, like, as you said, I have lots of challenges. And right now I'm sitting in Tokyo and I was today seeing little kids in the elementary school. And as you said before, they brutal. They asking you questions. Um, I saved myself by telling them that I'm the real transformer. And then they were happy. <laughs> One of the kids said, like, I want to have the same leg. So you see how kids open-minded to that situation and kids see the problems different. So I really love the way um, the understanding when we get challenged and uh, the understanding from kids when we get teach to have a different view on the problem. Yeah, no, I think so with, um, if you choose to try and win a Paralympic medal, um, you need to be really clear on why you're choosing this. Uh, and once you understand why you're doing that, it gives you real insight into what's important for you. Mm. And it sounds very corny, but you know, you, you express those values as an athlete and then you're going to express those values in whatever job you do next. Um, so that's kind of if you can help people do that transition. And then there's a, probably a sense making part as well, where you need to make sense and process the emotions that have surrounded your performances. And then then you can move forward. Uh, but it, it, it's this clarity around like, I mean, no one's going to make you try and beat Dave in a 200 meters or vice versa. <laughs> That's your choice. But when you make that choice, you need to understand why, what's driving you. And that gives you clues about what you're going to do next in terms of your identity. But yeah, it's the beauty of sport. You will, you will get aged out as well. So that's the beauty <laughs> of it. And uh, do, do, you think, um, do you think you have any uh, advice from returning from from those kind of high level competitions. So when you come back from them, you need to um, kind of, you need to resettle yourself back in the world you, you're coming back to. Um, so you need to ride the waves of emotions. They're going to show up. 
uh, and you need to be curious about other people. It's no longer about you. Um, and then you need to be in the here and now. And then once you've done that for a bit and you're resettled and you're with the people who matter to you, then you need to kind of sense make the experience. Uh, but yeah, you have to be as interested in the people back home as you are in yourself. That really helps the transition back. Oh, I love that comment. Yeah. I love that comment. It's completely, that's what happened to me. Awesome. Um, Didier, I'll come to you now. Um, how did you manage to mentally overcome the challenges which emerged after your injury? Hi, everybody. Uh, for me, I have no, no other solution. <laughs> Uh, so I was just retiring the army, the navy, after my accident. So uh, I separate with my wife, but I keep the watch of my kid. So um, again, children, and um, so I have to keep a, a, a formal activity to give an identity as a father, because you know. Most of you know that uh, when you are disabled, it's already a job. It's a 24-7 job. Um, when you are a father, it's also the same, especially when your kids are pretty young when uh, you are alone with. And uh, so uh, for me, sport arrive as, um, as a re rehabilitation tool and also as a philosophy of, of life. And so um, I use both my kid and um, my older son and uh, the sport to help me to grow up and um, to, 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 to being simply a, a man again. Thanks, Didier. Um, we've heard uh, from you there, especially from Heinrich, from myself, throughout the, the entirety of this conversation this afternoon, the role of family, how important family are. Um, so I think, Francisco, I'm going to come to you, and, and, and Alex, I'll, I'll come to you after, if I may. But Francisco, can you talk to us a little bit about the role that your family played in supporting your rehabilitation post-injury? First of all, I'd be honored to be here because for Colombian people and for Colombian soldiers, it's good to be here. Right now, as you can see, we are now uh, part of the Invictus. Welcome. For us. And many of our soldiers are in, right now in our room watching this, this, this panel. And family, that is good for us. It's essential in the rehabilitation process, On, not only physical, but also emotional and social. When I was in, I said, every, I said that at the time. When I was in the hospital room, I was in the I was lying, and a guy came into the room with a wheelchair and put it beside of my, and I said that that wheelchair is my leg right now, and I was thinking and, and said, how can I use a wheelchair? I don't know. My sister who was in the room, maybe. She was thinking the same, no? And she said, oh, that's a wheelchair. How people can use a wheelchair? And she sat in the wheelchair and started using this, the wheelchair. And I said, oh, OK, that's right. And family is very important because I said, my family, my family was the mirror, was my mirror. When I was happy, I said my family was happy. When I was sad, when I was, my family was sad. And I said, okay, when I was my father and my mother smiling all the time, that's why, because I was smiling. And, and also, my, my accident uh, was on September 2nd. My birthday is in September 26th. My birthday was in the hospital. And my mother comes into the hospital with a K and say, Oh, my little boy. Today is the 28th birthday. That's good for us because you are alive. 
no matter you don't have legs, but you are alive with us. Can I hug you? Can I kiss you? That's the most important in my life. And I said, my mother said that it's okay that I'm alive. No matter if I don't have legs. And all the time my family was working with me together, well, working with, with, and said, my mother and my father said, no, don't worry about you because we are here. We are here to protect you and to start together that new life in the disabled, with the disabled community. And I say, okay, that's right. And all the time they are with me. And you are talking about the sport. I am a biker. When I start practicing the, 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 the sport, hand biking, my mother said, you like that? Yes, I like that. You, you are able to, to move your, your handbike 10 kilometers? I said, ah, yes, I, I, I can do it. My mother said, okay, that's right. That is that new life. You are a military, you are an sport man, and right now we are supporting you in the sport. But when I fall down in my wheelchair, my mother said, oh boy, be careful. <laughs> be careful because all the time you are in dangerous places. That's right. But family is very important and essential in the rehabilitation process. Thank you so much, Francisco. It's so um, similar. It's so similar uh, to my, my own experiences. Um, and Alex, I, I just wanted to bring you into that just because the, the angle that you'll see the importance of family from is just a little bit different. You know, it's, it's inside the wire, as it were. And I, I just wondered if you might share a couple of words from your perspective. Family, family is so important and that's something that I was really first aware of early early on and noticing the difference in how people coped with their injuries and what they were going through to get healed to have their any secondary reconstruction and and their rehab if you were if you were young at the point of injury and you didn't have your own family or you had very other very little other family support it was much more difficult for that person to cope with what they were going through physically uh, and psychologically, um, as opposed to somebody who's older, they have a partner, they may have children. Um, you know, you've you've lived more of your life, you're a more fully formed uh, individual, um, and you, your motivations are different as well. And even even now, you know, any if you are low physically or psychologically it's a family affair isn't it it's not just you it's your it affects the whole family and and the decision from a um whether to have further surgery or not should be also a family family decision they they should be included in that in that conversation so for from my point of view um for, particularly for elective surgery where you've got time to consider the decision um, it's very. It should be a very collaborative decision with you and the patient and whoever else they want to include in, in that decision making process, in, including their immediate family. Absolutely. Thanks, Alex. I, I was just interested in, in your perspective there. So thank you very much for sharing it. And it, it, it sort of you know, this uh, this understanding of how crucial family is. Um, brings us to this wider uh, question of support in general. Um, in, in panel one, Josh and I both spoke about the importance of the, the peer group that we had around us. And we were very lucky because we were in a very specific environment. Um, but not everyone is, is, is as lucky as we are. And I'd just like to bring in um, a question from Angela in the audience today, um, where she has asked, so this is, Heinrich, I'll come to you first, and then Didier and, and perhaps Francisco, if we have time towards the end. Um, what groups for you were supportive when you when you first became uh, an amputee, when you first lost your 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 limbs? To be honest, I was re also really lucky to meet the right person at the right time, and also as we heard the family, like the mix of the family, and I remember till today is this like. My mom is too much curry, my father is too much pushy, and we say salt and sugar at the same time will make the taste. So I was really lucky to have those salt and sugar. Uh, but um, myself, um, um, 
facing the amputation and facing the difficulties of my amputation, I was lucky enough to meet a Paralympic athlete sitting next to me and just explaining me what's going on in the future. And uh, what I really realized is um, you only accept the situation when you understand the situation. So, and it's really important um, to know what's going on. Even the easiest questions, I remember myself when I was talking to my physio, my psychological doctors, they were trying to answer me the, the easy questions in a, in a uh, not easy way. So, And this guy, he just told me, listen, this is the way you, you have to choose it or you have to leave it. And uh, he also told me, if you choose the positive way of overcoming your disability, you do always have to explain people why you're lucky as an amputee, why you're lucky, why you're happy. So it's it will be hard. And uh, he prepared me. And um, and I think it's really important uh, also after my retirement. Uh, my dad told me after my gold medal in London, the first Sunday morning uh, breakfast, he told me, bring your medal into your room, sit down and enjoy the breakfast with the family. Never forget where you're coming from. And I think we need always be aware to share the happiness that comes to us, like you said, to you, to Josh, to me. So we need to support each other and supporting each other makes our lives easier. And um, this is something I realized um, through my whole uh, journey being an athlete. Uh, I'm realizing it right now. So it's really important to have people that pushes you and also have people that cares about you. Thanks, Heimik. Didier, any support groups that you found particularly helpful? But groups are really important, but um, I think that about myself, my experience, my first thing was to find and to let burn my libido vitalis. It's the sparks who help you to, to discover life, to stay a li living person. And um, the groups are important in your support, but on your own journey, on your personal journey, most of the time you're alone. And uh, my two words first resilience and then empowerment. And with the empowerment, I discovered the power of the groups. Because if you want to be a concrete disabled person, you need to be part of the humanity. And to be part of the humanity means that you need to build some uh, recognizing of your not just your value, not just your job, but also what you represent for the people around. And on this case, I'm really proud to to be part of the Belgium team of different spot groups that I meet, of my family, of course, my personal family, my large family. But um, all this part of things are. It's uh, a, little, a little egoistic, but uh, it's uh, my human ecology. It's uh, my my kinesphere, but on the last part of thing. And uh, what I want to say is uh, all these things are important. Groups are really important. You have to live with the groups who already exist, but you can be also an example or a leader to show uh, and to build different groups to help disabled person to to be involved in the society and to be more um, uh, to be more concerned by about what is about disability. Didier, thank you ever so much for those words. Really, really valuable. Um, we're going to close this panel session now. Um, you know. Francisco, all the way from Colombia, thank you for joining us. Heinrich from Japan, all the way, all the way from Japan, thank you for joining us. Didier in Belgium, uh, and Salisbury, uh, Alex in Salisbury, and Sarah, I imagine you're in Twickenham or St. George's. I can't remember which one you're at. But thank you, all of you, for joining us and, and providing that crucial insight to the human factor associated with the long-term effects of amputation. Um, we're going to move into our final session now, which is just a, a bit of a summary from myself before I hand over uh, to Richard Smith, who's the, the operations director of the Invictus Games Foundation. Uh, we started this session today in panel one um, talking about uh, medical research. So 
we were focusing on the advanced study, which is a UK based study looking especially at the long term effects of combat trauma. And within that, we have this subset of amputation. Um, whilst amputation is an area that is fairly well researched in terms of the long term effects, it's not particularly well understood. So uh, research efforts like the ex ex like the advanced study are crucial in developing and progressing our own understanding of, of, of medical knowledge. Um, there is clearly uh, an awful lot more work that we need to do to be able to improve ongoing lifelong rehabilitation for physical and psychological injuries. Um, we've heard about how important it is on the individual and on the individual's ability to take care of all the details. You know, uh, Alex talked about the cardiovascular risk in long term health. Uh, but we also heard about the psychological risks associated with long term injuries. So it's, there is a huge amount of importance on the individual's ability to take care of themselves, to manage themselves, to understand their own injuries, understand the treatment of their injuries and how this can be progressed into the best long term health that can be uh, achieved. We moved on in, in panel two to talk about 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 medical technologies we heard about uh the impact of amputation on bone health we heard from uh from anthony about how we might change that in the future using perhaps some elements of bone capping technology or even progressing in the longer term to limb regeneration such that amputation isn't perhaps such a problem as, as it is today if we can regrow our limbs then we don't have to deal with the other associated factors that come alongside the treatment of limb loss. We heard from Matt about osseointegration and we heard from Rodri and Pete about rehabilitation in, in healthcare systems in general. Uh, panel three, we moved on, on and focused specifically on the human factor. Now, this is where we really emphasized the importance of family through the entire process. Um, we heard it in the introduction, we heard it in panel one, we heard it even in panel two when we, 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 we brushed on it during the rehabilitation session. Family and support groups in general are crucial to underpinning the long-term success of an injury of an individual progressing through amputation as an injury. Um, your relationships and your families will be central to your rehabilitation, both from a support perspective, but also as a driving factor to push and progress you to the best possible condition you can be in. We understand that you'll have to work a little bit harder as an amputee. We understand that you have to work a little bit harder on the motivation. We understand that you have to work a little bit harder on your same self if you had not been injured. I know from my own first-hand experience that life is just a touch more difficult now uh, compared to how it would have been or was prior to injury uh, or compared to my non-injured peers. And it's often easy to underestimate or overlook this fact, but it also you also need to be aware of having that knowledge and keeping that knowledge in the bank and progressing beyond it. Yes, it's a little bit harder, but that does not make it impossible. You just have to work in slightly different ways. Ultimately, being comfortable in your new self, adjusting to the new normal, keeping yourself grounded. As Heinrich said in the last session, adding just the right amount of sugar um, balanced with the right amount of salt will keep you on the straight and narrow. You're keeping that grounded uh, sense of your own identity, what's important, what's around you and what you want from whatever it is that you're doing, be that sport or employment or whatever, keeping that grounded sense is key. Now, uh, today is absolutely shown that you can regain your sense of purpose after an injury and this has been emphasized by all of our brilliant speakers across all four panels so um, I would just like to uh, say before I hand over to Richard thank you all very much for attending and I will pass you to Richard Smith the operations director of the Invictus Games Foundation. Dave thank you thank you very thank you very much indeed and it just to say a few words to close and bring this great iteration of the conversation to a close. Um, each iteration of the conversation moves us forward. And as we heard at the beginning, this is our eighth. And it increases our understanding of our Invictus community, of our wounded, injured, sick um, uh, individuals and also their, their families. And we're so pleased and so delighted. And thank you so much for joining us today including, as Francisco said, um, 60 members of the wounded, injured and sick community from Colombia, one of our three new nations alongside Israel and Nigeria. It's just great uh, to have everybody here. And 
I've learned a huge amount, and I'm sure we have, and it's been so uplifting. And I've just, um, just to close, and really building on Dave's uh, comments at the, at the end there, I took away three key themes, which I'd just like to leave us with. The first one, the first theme I got um, from this and the long-term effects of amputation is the theme of evolution. We're constantly learning lessons, um, and so we should do. We heard, as Dave said, the importance of medical evidence from the Infarm study, drawing significantly on the campaign uh, from uh, Afghanistan, and the impact of physical, both physical and psych um, uh, psychosocial um, injuries and impact uh, from um, from long from traumatic or from significant trauma, and I think as Alex said to us, you know, this study is eight years out, and the average age um, of the uh, those taking part is 34. So we're constantly learning lessons, um, and Alex said we're constantly keeping an eye on it, and it's really important that we continue to gather this evidence and we were left with the thought of the importance of being able to inform other studies, such as the terrorist bombing from the Manchester arena. It's really important that we can learn lessons, not only for ourselves, for other organizations as well. And on that theme of evolution, um, also in medical treatment, we heard about the multidisciplinary um, uh, approach moving into the interdisciplinary approach, and then the impact of surgery and implants, electrical stimulation, um, changing sockets and osteo integration. And so evolution uh, is just uh, the first theme. The second one I'd like to leave, leave us with is that it's multifaceted. And this is, and we heard the term a couple of times or a few times during today that it is complex, but it's also really important alongside that theme of evolution of one of continuity. The patient has to be at the center uh, of everything that we do and in terms of the recovery and the rehabilitation. Um, and the, the, the patient and the, the treatment, and we heard, and Dave mentioned it, and uh, Alon mentioned, the patient is a center and the treatment must be individualized. And that not all treatments, such as osseointegration, will be relevant to everybody. So that's really important. Um, and of course, in some of these treatments and in this new technology, there is risk, and that builds on to that theme of multifaceted and complexity. Uh, and then there were a couple of sort of just um, phrases which I heard during today, which I really grabbed onto, and I think uh, re really uh, encapsulate a lot of what we've heard today. Dave mentioned it's rehabilitation over a lifetime. It doesn't just suddenly start and stop, it's looking after yourself and keeping in touch with rehabilitation and treatment throughout your lifetime. It just does just stop and start. It is an ongoing process going back to that theme of evolution. And then Heinrich left us, I thought, with another very good phrase, and it certainly struck me. You know, once you accept, um, you can accept the situation once you understand it. And again, it's that constant theme of continuity. And that leaves me uh, with the third theme I'd like to just bring out in bringing this uh, iteration to a close, and that's the human factor. The human factor, the human input, the person, the individual is the heart of everything. We heard um, a number of occasions looking after oneself in terms of lifestyle, the levels of stress, health, and importantly for us in Invictus, the importance of sport, how sport, which we know, can really help that rehabilitation, that personal motivation, uh, which we heard on a num number of occasions. We also heard again going, linking into the second theme um, of continuity, making sure that keeping in touch with uh, uh, the medical help and the medical treatment throughout is really important. We also heard about looking after what's important in your life. That's really important. what matters to you uh, and in your life, really looking after that and focusing on that. And we heard, and it's a theme which we hear constantly in Invictus, and um, Charles mentioned it right at the beginning, the importance of family whether it's your blood family, whether it's your military family, whether it's your peer group. But that just in everything we do, it's a central theme in rehabilitation recovery, the importance of family. And it's something, as Charles said right at the beginning, a theme which is so important and becoming increasingly important to us in the Invictus Game Foundation. And then finally, I don't think any of us could deny from Dave, 
to Josh, to Francisco, to Didier, that all of, uh, all of our wounded, injured and sick who have undergone uh, an amputation, acquired an amputation and their families, you are absolutely role models for us. You set an example for us, uh, being comfortable in your new life, comfortable in new circumstances, we can learn so much from you. Uh, you can be role models and you can be leaders yourself. And for that, on behalf of all of us, a massive thank you, because you really are a beacon, which we all follow uh, in, uh, in learn, understanding the, the effects of uh, amputation. So it just leaves me just finally to say there is a survey. I hope you've enjoyed today. I've learned a huge amount. Uh, there is a survey. It would mean a huge amount to us if you could just take the time to complete the survey. It won't take very long, but it does help us to keep building uh, the um, conversation and what we provide for you as we go forward. So please tell us what's worked, what hasn't worked, or subjects you'd like to see in the future. And then finally, it just leaves me to say a massive and heartfelt thanks um, to a few people. First of all, to all of our speakers for giving up your time. You're very busy people, but giving up your time uh, to join today, but also for everything you do for our community. Uh, and I think it's become so evident today what you do for our community and those who've acquired an amputation. A massive thank you. Dave, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, again, it, thank you so much for giving your personal experience. And uh, it's just been, it's just really focused today and given today a very special uh, feel to it. We're hugely grateful. And then if I could just uh, a very quick thank you to my team as well, to, or to the team who supported the conversation, Caroline, uh, Sam and Paul, who've done all the hard work in pulling this together, as well as to the re-attendance team. But that's, that's it. That leaves me to say thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we look forward to the next iteration, which will be in the first half of next year of the conversation, before we then meet again in person at the Games in Dusseldorf in September next year. Uh, but on behalf of the IGF, many thanks for joining us. Thank you very much indeed.